welcome everybody to lecture 11, Information Retrieval, Winter Semester 22-23. A bit more people in the room today, I attribute it to the warmer temperatures, maybe. Maybe it's also the topic. Experiences with Exercise Sheet 10, which was naive base, and uh, official course evaluation. I have a slide. Deadline is on Sunday at midnight, but please do it before. And today, uh, we generalize what we did last time to a theory of linear classifiers, so a lot of super fascinating uh, linear algebra again. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about history, naive base again, and then we talk about logistic regression, which is does something similar to naive base, but just mathematically more well-founded, and for classification, the more the method of choice. Will be very interesting and super nice mathematics. Exercise sheet 11 will also be nice, just the exact same task from exercise sheet 10, which is you have these movie descriptions and five genres, and now you use logistic regression. It will be very interesting to see where the code will be similar or different and uh, uh, to just run it and compare the results against naive base to see how, how different it is. And uh, again, like for naive base, will be very little code, but you have to understand it. So nice exercise. So exercise sheet 10, very little code, but linear algebra was uh, tricky for some. So for some, it was also relatively easy. Really nice to see how a lot can be done in a few lines. Indeed, if you look at the master solutions for pre predict, it's really it's one line for computing the probabilities and another line for computing the maximum. So can't be any simpler. And it's not that, that simple uh, an approach. I particularly like doing it based on matrices. Some people have said that they've heard it before, maybe not fully understood uh, naive base, but now doing it with linear algebra was really nice. It was nice and challenging exercise. I really liked it. I learned a lot by solving this exercise. Shouldn't man or woman be added to the stop word list? I will uh, talk about this on another slide. The idea was super simple, but it took a lot of time to find the NumPy function. So if people struggled, there were a few. It was mainly because of that, not so much translating it to linear algebra, because I had a slide on that, but actually doing it in, in NumPy. Matrices and NumPy is a hill too tall for me to climb. Very interesting lecture. Professor Bass seems to be very happy being allowed to do so much math. was very contagious. I like the formulation, being allowed to do. Yeah, but yeah, I like to do math. But I also like to do coding. Videos by Mr. Beast. Why, why did I ask that question? Maybe it will become clear in the end. I don't want to talk too much about it, although I could give a whole lecture about it. Most of you know him. I was not surprised. Most of you like his videos. I was a little surprised. Few critical voices. My voice will be a little bit more tiny bit more critical. Squid Game, interesting way to try and spend all the money. As you know, he likes to give away a lot of money. His videos are enjoyable, especially the Squid Game that was mentioned a lot. I watched his videos. They are funny and expensive. He likes to give away a lot of money, but he can do it because they have 100 million views and then you also earn a lot of money, so you can spend a few million per video. He puts a lot of effort into learning what people people liked, so like these videos are optimized for 100 million views, perfectly made to the reach, to reach as many people as possible. I like seeing people using money to actively improve the world. Part, he is a philanthropist also, mostly he gives away money for stupid things, but he also uh, does some philanthropy on the side, like uh, saving forests, cleaning oceans, and so on interesting person, but videos are not for me. So there were a few critical comments, not the style and type of content I enjoy. My opinion, I'm sorry, it's my personal opinion. When I watch these videos, the fast cuts drive me crazy. It's like also when there is action, it's filmed with a shaky camera, right? I know that's style, so hard for me to watch it. You also you have, uh, I mean, it's, it's very t 
super typical of social media contents nowadays, which I'm not surprised that it's so popular, but it's, it's also symptomatic in a way, looks to me like an expression of severe attention deficit disorder. I think he has severe attention deficit disorder. I've, I've read articles by him, I've watched a long interview with him. He says he can't listen when somebody else is talk, talking, he can't listen basically. He can just, so it's conversation with him is a, is a one-way street. And if you watch the videos, you can you can barely, you don't have time to think about anything, right? It's bam, bam, tuck, 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 and it's, it's just, it's a maximum speed and, and of course optimized to, to grab your attention and to keep your attention. I find it interesting because if I watch back my own, so my videos now, they are maybe the opposite of Mr. Beast videos. I think they used to be a little more like that in the past, so I think 10 years ago, I put a little more weight on entertainment and also making it faster. And it's interesting, I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time now. I've been giving lectures for over 30 years. I've actually moved away from it, doing it slower, not so much weight on the, on the entertainment, because I, I see a big danger there. I, I told you what I told you last time about math videos. You watch it, you find it entertaining, but you don't really learn anything, and especially for educational videos, uh, that, that's very dangerous. Of course, it's nice if you also have a little bit of entertainment, if it's enough to get you motivated, but it, it's surely not the main goal. I mean, the main goal is to learn something, and I think if you watch too many of these videos, it really does something with your brain. So I'm a little bit worried, especially if you, and I know, I mean, his main audience is teenage kids and, and teenage boys, also girls, but teenage kids. I think if you watch a lot of this content, it does something with your brain. So a little bit worried about this. Uh, yeah, but I would like to discuss more about this with you, but no time for this now. But I did like to mention it. So here are uh, results for the exercise sheet 10. We had five genres. I don't show the data again. It was uh, movie descriptions from IMDb. <coughs> we picked these five classes. Here were the results. The frequencies were interesting. So half was comedy. We did this on purpose because it's very common in learning that you have uneven distribution, so you had a lot of comedy, but only 4% fi science fiction, and actually also interesting, it was the distribution from IMDb, so you have a lot of comedy there, and not so much uh, science fiction. So here, just precision and recall value, if you do F1, it's a kind of average, it's the harmonic mean. Just so comedy, interestingly, uh, was uh, easiest to predict, but there's another slide on this. I just say a little bit. It's, it's very interesting. Producing numbers is one thing, but then understanding what does it mean is another thing. So when you do a project later or thesis with us, this will become an important part, understanding what the results mean. Does it mean that comedy was easiest to predict? Not necessarily, because it was so frequent, right? You can just always say, comedy, comedy, then you're right half of the time, because half, half of the lines were comedy. Yeah, and let's look at the word, uh, words in a second. Also, what does it mean when recall, like here for documentary, is much higher than precision? It means, uh, I, I wrote it here, that the naive base classifier tended to predict documentary a lot. Just imagine the extreme, if you uh, say documentary all the time, you get perfect recall. You get all the documentaries which are there, they are right, but most of the time you are wrong, right? 89% of the time you will say documentary when it's not, but for the 11 documentaries it will be right. So getting high recall, low precision, think about it yourself means you tend to predict that a bit too much and the other way around. So it's good to have this balanced somehow. Of course, that's not an explicit goal of naive base, but it, it manages somehow. They are not too far apart. 
You also may be noted that some classes have more specific words than others. For horror, there were words in the top 20 like killer, mysterious, old death, night town, that seems to fit. For romance, it was more like man, woman, story. These words occurred also in the other classes. What I've, uh, let me just go to the terminal here for, uh, if I, here I have the master solution, if I just uh, execute it with a normal stop word list. So we have like uh, things like, yeah, uh, woman, man, of course they woman, man, you, you find it a lot here. <laughs> I found really interesting uh, young, I mean a super bias alert, right? Young is the most frequent in all, so when you make a movie it's important that you have not young and good looking people there. So interesting bias, that young is a stop word for, for movie plots. And uh, I've done one thing, and some of you have maybe experimented with this, there was the stop words list and I just added word man, woman, young, old, life story, family, father, Right, what is a stop word, like a word without particular meaning, depends on the con context and in case of movies these words are not particularly uh, predictive of particular class, daughter, girl. it's just people occurring in movies, friend, friends. So if I take uh, that list, so if I take extended here as the last argument, I get a little more interesting uh, words here. So now with romance I have marriage here in the end and yeah, it becomes a little bit better. I just wanted to quickly show you this. Science fiction looks very predictive, scientists and mysterious. Okay, mysterious we also have for horror I think, yes. Yeah, but so uh, overall it, it works, it's not great, right? So it's also interesting to see it's not easy to solve such, uh, but it's also not easy as a human, right? If you just get the text and you have to predict the genre, that would have been an interesting experiment too. Do it for yourself and try to predict the class and see, oh, we could do that for the next, when we do this the next time. Human performance. Okay, here's a video about bias in movies if you want to watch it. Which precision is considered good? Just one more slide for, for understanding the results. So one uh, baseline is uh, you just guess uniformly at random. So I just guess without looking at the words. Then what do you get? You get one over number of classes, right? Just think about it. I have a movie. I, I have no idea. I don't even look at the words and I just roll a die with five faces and I say comedy. Chances one over five uh, that I'm right. And actually it's easy to do uh, better by just always predicting the most frequent label if you have uneven distribution. So here I think it was uh, actually 50% when you round it up. So, right here were the frequencies. Sorry. 50% of the movies were comedy. We did that on purpose, which means when I don't want to do anything special, I just always say comedy and I get a 50% uh, overall precision. Because for 50% of the movies, it will be right. <coughs> And uh, so, and, and I, I said that because actually in papers, in research papers, when you read them, it's actually pretty frequent. You have something and you should always ask yourself, okay, what's the baseline when I do something really simple? And it might be that you have a very skewed distribution, so and actually the baseline is already 80% or 90%. Such, such problems are there. Spelling correction is an example for it. Yeah, you have most of the text is correct, you just have a few spelling mistakes. So you can have a very high baseline by just doing nothing. Here's another baseline. You pick the label according to the distribution in the training data. I will not do the, this is actually not better than this. So baseline two is the best if you don't want to do anything special. I leave it as an exercise or maybe exam question to compute what comes out then. Okay, but uh, 
let's go on with, okay, there's one more organizational thing, the course evaluation. Who has received, who hasn't received this email on January? Oh, it seems to have worked this time. Everybody in the room has received an email about the evaluation. That's great. Okay, because, uh, so, before I say what you should do for those, anybody in, on Zoom hasn't received it? That's great, but uh, for those of you watching this and not having received it, I will say something in a minute. We are very interested in your feedback, so please take your time. I've already said it last week, I say again, you have spent so much time on this course, please spend 20 minutes on this uh, evaluation and uh, be honest, concrete and uh, fair. So try to be in a good mood when you do it, try to be fair in both directions, uh, concrete, I mean, not just, yeah, nice, or no, I didn't like it, that's not concrete, and of course, honest. We particularly like the free text comments, grades are important too, but there are all these text fields where you can write something, and uh, it doesn't say here that you get, where does it, does it say it on the exercise sheet, Natalie? Uh, yeah, I hope so. Oh yeah, I should have said it on the slides, but here it is. You get something for this, right? You get uh, 20 points, which replace the points of your worst exercise sheet. And you don't, it's enough if you write in your experiences, txt, I did it. Of course, you should be honest there also, but we will just believe you. We will not check, but please uh, do it and be honest, and then, then you get the 20 points. So just as an encouragement for really doing the evaluation. The deadline is Sunday, so it's not the deadline for the sheet, which is Tuesday noon before the lecture. It's Sunday midnight, so please do it until then. And uh, it's centralized, so it's not run by us. It's run by the university, and if, if it's over, it's over. We can't do anything about it anymore. If you have any problems, you didn't receive the mail, any other problem, we have a sub-forum on Daphne evaluation. You should just check as quickly as possible if it works for you. If not, right there, we will see what we can do. After the deadline, there's nothing we can do. Any other questions about this part before I move on to the actual contents? Okay, so I move on to the actual content. It starts relatively lightly and will get more mathematical as we go along. So linear classifiers. Last time we talked about one classifier, naive base. We will now generalize this a little bit. And last time we looked at so now we just have objects in uh, d dimensions and we have two classes and last time in the example I called them A and B so this time I just that's uh, you will see later why and let's say yeah so I'm in 2D and here I have some minus 1 thingy so that's now points in uh, 2D and here I have some other points in 2D, and they have the plus one label. Yeah, so this is a point, this is a point, I just write the label beside of it. And now I have another point here, and the question mark is, uh, yeah, I have a, yeah, let me maybe write the point, and then maybe I write it in red and the question mark should this now get plus one or minus one and uh, I will talk about how to generalize this to more classes but we will not do it today just two classes today so and what we try to do in what what's linear about it now we have 2d and I try to separate it by a hyperplane I will talk about what a hyperplane is on the next slide but in 2d it's just a 1d thing which is a line so I just want to find a line which separates the minus ones from the plus ones. Of course, that's not always possible. I also have a slide about this. But if it's possible, 
then I could do this, and now I just say everything to the right of this line is plus one, and everything to the left is minus one. And of course, for this point, it depends on where I put the line, right? I could have also put the line like this. I don't draw it, as to not mess up the picture, and then this would have been minus one. So it's not that this line is defined by my samples. There are still different ways to do it. Okay. So that's just what our framework for today. Linear classification. I have points with minus one, points with plus one. I want to separate them and then use that for prediction. And it doesn't have to be 2D, but for my drawings I will use 2D or 3D. Here's a definition of a hyperplane. And that's important because it's kind of the basis for everything else. So a hyperplane in D dimensions, so we've just seen one in one dimension, which was a line. That's one typical dimension. No, what we have seen, sorry, was a hyperplane in two dimension, and a hyperplane in two dimension, it's always one dimension less, so a line. So I have a, let me draw a picture. And then, so this is maybe the most common definition, which you know from, let me try to draw something here, three-dimensional, so this is, and we are now in three-dimensional space, this thing here, this is now a plane, it's my hyperplane, and what I have now, I have some, maybe here, that's a point A, so here's my, uh, my origin, is maybe somewhere here, so that's my origin, so this hyperplane doesn't have to go through the origin. So what I have here, this is a vector A, which somehow lies on the hyperplane. It can be any point. And now I have uh, vectors which span the plane. So in case of a hyperplane, which is two-dimensional, this is two vectors. And let me call them, so I have a basis here, H1 and H2. This is supposed to be a right angle here. I mean, it's uh, like tilted because it's perspective uh, drawing. And now, how can I write uh, any point? I can write any point. It's written here, any point x. For example, I have a point x here. x can now be written as a, so like my base point plus, and now I have some alpha 1 times h1 linear combination of my two base vectors. I think that's the most easy to understand definition of a hyperplane. So every point on the plane is, I go to this a, and now I have some linear combination of these two vectors. This is something, I don't know, you should have learned it in school, but I'm not sure. Here's another definition which uses normal vector, which is a little harder to understand, but mathematically equivalent, and we will prove it. And it's just, you have some normal vector w, and let me draw the normal vector with, uh, and this is now, so this is now my w, which is a d-dimensional vector, and it's normal, which means it's orthogonal to everything that's in the plane, and there's only one such vector, because the plane is two-dimensional. And I have an offset b, which I cannot draw here, it's just a number. And now my hyperplane is simply all points where the dot product of the normal vector and the point is b. I mean, this, look, this is not so intuitive, and it, and it doesn't look like the same as here. But actually, these two definitions are the same. And because in learning, and also for today's look, lecture, you always work with this here, uh, we should, I think, take some time to prove that these two are actually equivalent to understand that. And that's what we will do now on the next slide. And, and what I will use several times in this proof is what you can always do if I have uh, some vectors in d-dimensional space, let's say I have two vectors in, in, in three-dimensional space, then I can always find another vector that's orthogonal to them. And in particular, if these are pairwise orthogonal, but also if they are not, I can always find remaining vectors, so I can always complete to a basis. I mean, that's, I, I don't prove that. 
So let's take our, let's see whether we can prove this. So let's take our one definition. So we have a hyperplane here, which is all points which I can write as sum A plus a sum of, so I'm in D dimension, so I have D minus one, here I write alpha I times H I are my basis vector, where uh, alpha one and two alpha D minus one, these are any coefficients, which means they are real numbers. Okay, now we uh, pick a W such that W is orthogonal to all these, and this I can do by what I just said, to all these D minus one. Yeah, I have uh, three dimension, two vectors which span something, and now take a third one which is orthogonal them, to them, and uh, pick B, and I just define B as the dot product of this W and this A here. And now I define an H prime as the number of points where the dot product between this W and this and a point X is B. Like that's my... And I... Uh, this is not a closing parenthesis, this was just some weird thing. Okay, that's still a little bit weird. And now I want to... So we want to prove... We want to prove... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking and writing at the same time. That always goes uh, wrong. We want to prove that uh, H and H prime are the same yeah, set. So I've given this and I have uh, something in, in these two notations. Where am I? Maybe I should, yeah. I have this and I have this. This uses this definition one, definition two, and they are exactly the same set. And I think it, it helps to understand by just doing the proof. So let's do the proof. To prove that two sets are the same, you prove that one is a subset of the others and, and vice versa. So let's do H is a subset of H prime. How do you prove that? Well, you take an element from H and then you prove that it's also in uh, H prime. So let's take an X from H, which means <laughs> I'm, uh, which means I can write X as, yeah, so there exist these uh, alpha 1, alpha d, and please pay uh, attention that I don't make any mistakes or logical errors, such that x is a plus sum a 1 d minus 1 alpha i h i, and try to understand what it means. So I can write x as this linear combination and the anchor point, and now I want to prove that, uh, that it's in h prime. So how do I go about these proofs? Well, I want to prove that it's in h prime, and uh, h prime says something about the dot product of w with this point, so without much thinking I just take the dot product. So let me just take the dot product and see what happens. Well, this is uh, W, everything is linear, so it's the dot product of W and A plus everything is linear, so note that H is a vector and these are scalars, so real numbers, so I can just pull it in because everything is linear, that's why it's called linear algebra. So now I have the W times H i. So this here is, uh, let me do that in beautiful orange, this is zero because, uh, yeah, because uh, the W is orthogonal. The W is orthogonal to each H i, that's just how I picked it, which means, uh, yeah, and this is uh, B. 
by definition, right? I don't have to, <laughs> and we are done. <laughs> I mean, that's it. And hence, maybe write it here to save some uh, space. So it's equal to uh, B. That was simple, that was the easier direction. This is equal to B, and hence uh, the axis in H prime. <coughs> ah, I don't know whether... Hmm, maybe, yeah, maybe let me do the other direction as well. Oh yeah, please. Where comes the B from? Yes. yes. So B is just, so this in the one definition I have uh, an A and these things, and the other definitions I have a W and a B. These are just my parameters here. And I want to say that the definitions are the same, so I have to correlate the W and the B with these things. And I say if you correlate them, then the B is just the W times the A. But it's good that you asked, because it gives me the opportunity to make one meta comment. It's good to follow these proofs, I think, when I do them, but to really understand them, you have to do them yourself. So the ultimate, uh, yeah, and it's, a, I think, a very important comment also for learning. I will also say it again in the last lecture. If you want to learn this and you want to check whether you learned it, you have to put it aside and then do the proof yourself. And don't learn it by heart, because, I mean, just try to learn how it works, and now you try to prove yourself h equals h prime, and see if you can do it. And it's better not to learn it by heart, but to learn the ideas. Maybe you want to do it a little bit differently. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try this direction. So now I have an x, which is an h prime, which means and, and that's, it's easier, you can already see it now. This definition is a little more unintuitive, but it's much easier to work with, right? Here you have to say, now I have these uh, coefficients, many of them, I can write x as this ugly sum. Here I can just say, <laughs> I can just say, okay, the dot product, so that's really very nice, I can write it very compactly, is w. Okay. And now I want to show, okay, if x satisfies this, then it's an h. Now I can write it as a plus this sum. Okay. Okay, we can write, how do we go about this? We can write any, any x from d-dimensional space, where we are now, as x equals to well, we can write it as the sum of these h things and d minus 1 alpha i times uh, mm, h i plus alpha d times, and let's take the a, and let's assume here, uh, okay, we assume here, let me make that assumption and later assume that a is linearly independent. That a Oh, actually it's enough to assume that A is not zero, because if A is not zero, then it's uh, linearly independent. So, and hence, uh, and let me go back to the A linearly independent from the H1 from these other d minus 1 things, right? So it's not, if you want to, I mean, think about this picture, I have my h1 and h2, and a lives outside this plane, right? It doesn't, no, actually it's not, um, let me just say that uh, I think it's not quite right. a could, mm -hmm. 
I think what I want to say is that the plane does not go through the origin. If the plane does not go through the origin, then the A is linearly independent, okay. And maybe let's continue with the proof and then see where we need this. So I'm sorry for the... Mm, assume that... I can, I'm, I'm assuming that the A is linear, the A is linearly independent from these, uh, and if that's not the case, uh, the plane goes through the origin. Let me just note that, and that case is actually an easy case. Otherwise, I thought I don't, uh, H contains the origin. I mean, in general, a two-dimensional plane in 3D does not go through the origin. These are very special planes. So let's continue with uh, that. So we can write this like this, and now we have, uh, so, we can just plug this in, so now W, Mm -hmm. Let's write it the other way around, B. I now just take this thing here and plug in this X and write it the other way around. B is equal to W times this, and I pull in the W, so it's sum A1, D minus 1, alpha I times W, and again HI, plus and here I have alpha d times w times a. I have a question. Yes, one second. One second. So this is again a zero. We have seen this, and this is again b. Yes, please. How are the bracket rules for the dot product? So I'm, yeah, I'm being a bit sloppy here because in linear algebra, you can basically do whatever you like with linear factors. You can pull them into any vector. So let me maybe just write it upstairs here. So for example, if I have uh, two vectors, let me write it upstairs here. Let's say I have two vectors, x and y in Rd and I have a scalar alpha in R. And now the question is, what if I have alpha times the dot product between X and Y? I mean, now it's well defined. Now I've written parentheses. And in linear algebra, linearity, basically everything is always linear. I mean, so you don't have to write the parentheses. So this is the same as writing. I take the multiple of x here and take the dot product with y, or I take x and I take the dot product of alpha with y, or I take the dot product first and then times alpha. And, and this even has a very simple intuition. What does a, a factor do to a vector? And think about a factor larger than one, then it will stretch it, right? And so whether I stretch this vector, and if you think about the dot product, maybe let's also write that down. The dot product of two vectors is, is just uh, the sum of xi times yi, just of the components, right? So if I multiply a vector by something, each component gets multiplied by that scalar, and it doesn't really matter where I multiply and which one I stretch. So here I'm write, not writing the parentheses because it's all linear. Okay, so I get here alpha d times uh, b, which means uh, b is alpha d times b, which means uh, either, and this is a situation oh, I think in this uh, Q&A session we had, I, I showed this 
one has to be careful here. Two, two solutions are possible here, right? If you have such a thing. So either alpha dd is one or b is zero. It's actually very frequent that one has something like this. So one shouldn't be too fast here and just say uh, alpha d is one. That's not necessarily true. If b is zero, alpha d can be anything and it's true. So one of the two is true. Now if alpha d is one, we are done. Then we are done. Oh, now it gets... I'm sorry, I can't write. Then we are done. Uh, because now I wrote x is something, I mean, note this here, right? Alpha d is 1, so it's just, uh, then it's exactly, yeah. Uh, we have proven x is in h, because it has exactly that form. And if b is equal to 0, what happens if uh, b is equal to 0? If this case, if b is equal to 0, it means, uh, huh, it means this dot product here is 0. I thought I don't need that special case, but if b is equal to 0, th certainly then a is uh, orthogonal to w. That's what it means, right? So my a is orthogonal to w, which means uh, which means a <coughs> lies, it means a lies in the hyperplane. A, uh, I mean, I chose my, this case is a little bit complicated, a lies in the hyper, I mean, a is orthogonal to w, w was chosen so that it's orthogonal to these uh, d minus one things spe spanning the hyperplane. If my a is orthogonal to this one, it has to be linear combination of uh, one of these things spanning the hyperplane. And if my a, if my anchor point lies in the hyperplane, it just means that my hyperplane, if you think about this picture, goes through the origin. If a, I mean usually a does not lie, this vector does not lie in the hyperplane. So it's a, uh, but I don't think I want to go into depth here too much. So uh, H goes, and that was the uh, A's, A contains the origin. And uh, the case when H contains the origin, I think I will skip it here, because that's the easy case. I mean, in general, it does not. Let's maybe go on. This was like a little... I think it doesn't get more complicated than that. I think that was the most complicated mathematics. Now it gets a bit easier again. This is a very nice proof. How do you compute? And so now, from now on, it was really just a getting warmed up. If you had problems understanding it, don't bother. You will be able to understand the rest. The purpose of this was getting warmed up and to say that now we will always work. And let me just maybe circle this for the rest of the lecture, we will work with this very nice definition of a hyperplane. So we are always given a W and a B. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, yeah. I hope so, but let me just, uh, I hope that the hyperplane is always one dimension less. Yes. Okay. Whew. Whew. Yes, it's one. So it's not, you can't have in five dimensional space a two dimensional hyperplane. It's exactly one dimension less, which means it separates the space, right? That's what it does in any dimension. It cuts it into two halves. That's the point of a hyperplane. It always cuts the space into two halves, which is perfect tra transition. Why it makes sense to uh, use it for classifiers and to compute the distance uh, from a point to a hyperplane. So, 
And computing, just by this nice definition here, you can compute the distance by just taking w times x minus b and dividing it by the length of w, and by just looking at the sign, it tells you am I on this side or on that side. I mean, it can't get any nicer than this. And let's just prove this. That's also a very nice proof and also a not uncommon exam question. So let me just draw, a, this is now my hyperplane and my examples from now on will always be in 2D. That's very nice. So now I have this hyperplane and now let's, I don't know, let's put, take a point to the left. We could also take one to the right. And now the question is what's the difference, what's the distance from x to h? Now, first some very basic geometry, what's the distance of a point to a plane, a line in this case, it's like the shortest distance, and that's always, let me use orange here, orthogonal. So let me, so it's this here, right? And that's a right angle. So now this is a hyperplane, so let's say, so we have the normal vector is now this one, so let's this is my w, and let's say it points in this direction. The direction is now important. And let's uh, let this have a direction as well as well. And now let's uh, and let's say this uh, I think I want to draw this in blue. I like it a little bit nicer. I don't I'm not sure I have a very strict color scheme here. And let me call this, uh, this distance here is what I'm interested in. This was not nice. So this is the distance I'm interested in. And let's call it R. Or let's call it D. Why not call it D, R? I don't know. Let me call it R. Okay, so what is this R? And let me define one other thing. Let me define W0. That's just my normal vector divided by the length of the normal vector. So uh, this is a unit vector pointing in the same direction as uh, W same direction as W. So now I can write my x. How can I write my x? I can write my x as, well, let me give this a name also. Let me call this here. It's like the projection of x on h as this x0 plus and now I take the unit vector of this w times my distance, right? And I hope you agree with that. So it's just, I'm going from this point here, I don't know what it is, I just give it a name, and now I have my unit vector pointing in that direction, away from this hyperplane to the right side, and I take it r times, that's just r times the unit vector when r is the distance definition of the distance. Okay, now let's just, I mean, to prove something you always multiply with uh, w because that's the definition of this. So this is now w times x0 plus r times w dot product w0. I'm again doing the linearity thing here. And it, it's always the same, we've already seen that. W times x0, what's this? What's W times x0? I hope you are listening and not watching Mr. Beast video. What's W times x0? B, oh yes, it's B. Yeah, because x0 lies on the plane, right? And also try to see how I do mathematics here. I do the obvious thing. I have my x now and I want to show that it's an h, so let me just multiply it with w and see what happens. So a lot of mathematics, you sometimes need this uh, clever idea, but a lot of it is just going along with it. And now I write this and I see, okay, 
this looks like something I can simplify. And here I have W times W0. Well, W times W0, I, I know what W0 is, so let me... So this is, uh, it's W times W divided by this W, and what's, uh, yeah, what's W times W? It's actually, let me just do maybe, so if I have a dot product of a vector with itself, if X is a vector in two dimensions, then uh, the dot product is just the sum uh, of the xi squared, right? That's just what it is, which means it's the norm of the vector square. Because if you take the sum squared, the uh, square root of it, you get the length, so this is the length squared. And so here I have the length squared divided by the length, so it's just the length. So I'm just plugging in some obvious things. So I get this here, which means I get this is now uh, B plus R times W, which means uh, my R, which I'm interested in, the distance is now W times B minus uh, no, w times x, I'm sorry, minus b divided over divided over w, which is uh, what I claimed here, right? The distance is just this, and uh, yeah, in my, I think I shouldn't finish too early here, so this is And this is greater than zero because in my picture, I mean, this is just R, yeah, the W points in this direction. If the W would have pointed in the other direction, then, uh, then this would have been a minus here. But just by the way I drew the picture, this is greater uh, or equal to zero meaning uh, x lies in the direction of, let me, uh, let me write it in parentheses, x lies on the side and I was again thinking and writing, it lies on the side of h where uh, w points lies on the side of H where W points. I mean, you don't have left and right really in uh, high dimension. You have to define where you stand to define left and right. So what you can say, let me just use the, the larger pointer here. So the sign of this is it just tells you it's uh, greater or equal to zero if the point lies on the side of the hyperplane where the W points and uh, it's less, e it's negative when it's on the other side and if it's zero if it's right on there. And everything what's written above here follows from that. Is there any question about this? Yes? Oh. Uh, in the last uh, thing you wrote, it's a many parentheses, but up in the written text you use the distance. Are they like the same, or is there a reason why? W what exactly is your question? Are they the same? Is what the same? So this is just this part, right? Yes, yeah, so like this term that you have, this fraction, is that the same as the fraction you have up in your text? This here? Okay, I've left out that last step. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you're completely right to note this. So here, I use the absolute value. And here, I just use parentheses. So and this was just one case. So yeah, let me say this and let me also write this. So here, I, used it, I just drew the picture for the case where x lies on the, same, on the side of the hyperplane where w points. 
And when I do that case, then this thing here is positive because it's on this side. And then this thing here, I can just write, I could have written it here. I mean, since it's positive, I could just also write this, right? That's the same thing for this case. W. <coughs> and uh, case, let me just write it, the case where x lies on the other side can be proved analogously. Analogous. If I would do that case on the other side, now I would have x is x0 minus r times w0. If I would, I, I won't show it now, because my w, I mean, it's fixed. It still points this in this direction. x lies on the other side. I would have a minus here. And now I would have b minus wx. I would have it the other way around. And <coughs> I mean, I, I won't do it now, but it will also work out. So that in both cases, this comes out but you're right to note that it's the, I mean, the distance must be a positive value, so I need the absolute things here. Yes, please? One more question. Yes? Which vectors are orthogonal to W? Oh, x is, okay, x is not orthogonal to w, x, just the dot product to w is some fixed constant. Only when b is zero, this means x is orthogonal to w, but not, this, it's hard to get an intuition for this. This means all vectors where the dot product with some w is b. I mean, that's just, it is a line, we proved this on the previous slide, but it's not orthogonal to w, that's not what it means. So in general, b is not equal to zero? b is not equal to zero, that would be a very special case. If b is equal to zero, then, uh, maybe let me draw that case, I mean, it's great that you ask. Let's just draw that picture here, so if, uh, This would be the case of a hyperplane, so if this is x and this is y, and I'm in two dimensions, this would be an example of a hyperplane going through the origin. And now, if I do that, now my uh, w goes like this, and now all elements of x are indeed all elements that are all vectors that are orthogonal to w in that special case. So if you just, any vector on the, any vector on h, so let me take this one now is orthogonal to the w, but that's only true for a, a, a hyperplane that goes through the origin. It's not true in general, and in general b is not equal to zero. So for b equals to zero, it's true. It's great that you asked this question, and I think, yeah, there, there are all these little questions to get the intuition right, and I think it needs, needs time, but it's very good questions. Let me go on. That's easy now, and then I think one more thing before the break, or maybe the break right away. Generalization to, oh, I think I'm... How do you do for more classes? Just very quickly. This is just two classes, and it's limited to two classes, hyperplane. One way is just to think about our movie things. We have now five classes. You just build a classifier for each of them. Comedy or not comedy. Horror or not horror. You just do this separately. So now you have uh, five answers. Which one do you take? Uh, and... Uh, yeah, which one do you take? It doesn't say it here. You could uh, take the one which has the... Which one do I take? 
Let me just go on. I think I said it here. Okay, one is I, I could just compare all pairs, and uh, it doesn't say here. And <laughs> yeah, is it comedy or horror to just play a little tournament? That's one option. Or you could extend the theory. So naive base doesn't, yeah, naive base, for example, does more than uh, two classes. Yeah, it doesn't say here. Yeah, I should write it here because I think that's the one which you should use for exercise sheet one. Yeah, pick uh, pick the class with the highest prediction. Yeah, yeah. But but it should have been said for pick the class with the you're right, thank you. With the highest uh, prediction value, I mean. Okay. <coughs> oh yeah, here's one more. I mean, what do you do when uh, the data is not linearly separable? Let me just show you a very nice example but just so that you have seen it. So let's say my data is in R1. So this is the origin. Let's say here I have a point, so that's 1, and that's 2. Here I have minus 1, here I have minus 2, and so on. Oh, I don't even have to write this. And let's say this here, let me write the labels. This here is, uh, no, let me write them in. Let's say this has plus one, and this has plus one, and this has minus one, and this has label minus one. Clearly I can't, I mean, a separator now would be a point. So here I'm in, in R1 world. And now let me take the following transformation. Let me take the transformation, each point from R1 is transformed to x comma x squared from R2. And let's just do that. So if I transform <laughs> the point 1, it's, it becomes 1, 1 in 2D. And so now let me draw it in 2D. This becomes, that's now the point 1, 1. 2 becomes the point uh, 2 comma 4. So it's now up here. This here becomes the point one w uh, minus one one minus one one, and this becomes the point minus two four minus two four. <coughs> And now let me again write the labels. So this was labeled plus one, this was labeled plus one, this was labeled minus one, this was labeled minus one. And uh, see and behold, now I can linearly separate them. And now they are in 2D, right? In 1D, this was not linearly separable. I apply some function. This was, a, there are many functions which I could use here. I don't even need the square. And now in 2D, I could find a hyperplane, any one. For example, this one could also use the horizontal one. We are not doing this here, but uh, this is a very important uh, technique for making because you wonder what's the purpose of linear separators when most di data you cannot separate linearly. Well, by transforming in a higher dimensional space, you always can, if it's only high dimensional enough. Okay, let's look at naive base again. Mm. Okay, that should be quick, because that's basically what you have done for the exercise sheet. You're looking a little tired. I think we should make a quick break, and then we go on with this. So let's make a short break here for five minutes, then we go on. I think it's worth it. See you in five minutes. So let's, uh, now it will be a little simpler, simpler, and then it will become a little more 
complicated, but also super. The hardest part we have behind us. Let's just look naive base what you did for the exercise sheet. So now our words are called V, big change. They used to be called W, now they are called V. I hope, yeah, because W, I mean, I could have used this W, which we have used all the time here, right? It's just always called W in learning, this vector here. It's always called W because it's weights. It's a weight function in learning, and I don't want to use another vector here because then we would be confused for other reasons. But it was words last time, so now words are V for things from the vocabulary. And what does uh, naive base do? It computes this probability of a certain class for a certain document, and it was just the probability of these learned things times the class probability divided by this funny thing which we don't know and know, don't need because it's the same for all classes. And uh, this we already saw, I already gave you that as a hint. You can write it as, okay, I have a document where I have this word three times, then it's just that probability to the power of three, and the three is just the term frequency. And now I just very quickly go through what you already did for last sheet, that I can use this to write this nicely in linear algebra. Namely, so this is nothing new, so that's just repetition. So I can write the naive base probability like this, where I have the term frequencies here. So let's just use, abbreviate this here. That's what you commonly do. Instead of writing this variable here is this class, this document, you just write the value of the variable. It's very common when you read anything on deep learning, although it's not correct. It's like an abuse of notation but it's cl usually clear what it means. So this is the probability of a class for a document, and I now take the logarithm for various reasons, which we learned in the last lecture, one of which is that now everything becomes linear. The TF is now pulled in front. I multiply it now with the log probabilities. Here I also have a log probability minus the log of this thing, which we don't know and never need. And now we could write it like this, you also did it for the exercise sheet. I don't even have the one here yet, the additional one. My document, just written as a document with term frequency scores. My p-vector probabilities, just the log probabilities. This should look familiar to you. And then what I do, the log of the thing naive base computes is now this dot product plus the log of the class probability minus this thing. And now before we add this, uh, do this additional trick with adding the one here, so that it's even simpler, just one dot product, let's, uh, <coughs> let, let's first continue with this. So if I now compute the probability, now it's just two classes, because we did linear classification, you just have two classes. For class A, it's now just this, D times this is the vector of log probabilities for class A. This is the vector of dot probabilities for class B. And this is just the class probability. Now, if we want to know, and we will do it for our example in a second, then it will become very clear which of these probabilities is larger, which is the same as asking which of the logs is larger. Then, haha, there's a log missing here, right? I think it is, there should be a log here, ln. Yeah, so it's just d times the difference between these vectors plus, now this cancels out, we don't need to know it, it cancels out, we just want to know which one is. And we wonder, is this greater or equal to zero? If yes, then a is the more likely class. So it's just d times this difference plus and here I already took, it's a bit, yeah, the ln of uh, PA divided by, yeah, just very quickly, I hope, I mean, we use that so much, but ln x minus ln y is just, oh, let me do it with a and, oh, let me do it with, this is just one of the laws of logarithm. It's just ln of x over y, which is what I used here. 
right? Where this here, PA minus PB, I can now write as LN, and I'm using the same thing here, LN of the quotient. So I have just one vector here, LN of the quotients of the two word distributions for the two classes, and LN of the two class distributions. And now, what I do, I just define this as B, as negative B, and this as my W. Right? It already looks suspiciously similar then to what we had on the previous slides. So if I now call my document, look, this here I call X, this I call W, let me use the laser pointer, this I call X, this I define as W, and this I define as minus B, and then it's just W times X minus B greater or equal zero or less for the other class. So. Let's look at this for, for our toy example. This was our toy example, and let's see whether we still get the probabilities right. I mean, they were so simple. PA was the probability for class A. They were both equally likely, so it was both one half. And then we had four probabilities we learned. It was the small a for class A, and this looks to me like it was two-thirds. And then we had, so this was the word distribution for class A, two-thirds A, one-thirds B. And then we had the word distribution for uh, class B, which was just the opposite. It doesn't have to be. So these two are not related. That was a coincidence. Of course, it was not a coincidence. It was how I... I constructed the example to have nice numbers here. And now let's just uh, do this. So the W is, let's just go back. What, what, what did I say here? The W is this vector here. It just contains the logarithm of the quotients of these probabilities. So let's just do that. That's what I did here. So that's uh, it's a vector. Ln, and this should be the, for word A, the quotient of AA and P, B, uh, <laughs> let me just to get it right, it's, yeah, it's, it's just per word, so the first dimension is for the first word divided by the two classes, so I have to make sure I get the it's this one, that's how I defined it. And this here was the ln of P, now it's for word B, second dimension is for word B, I just take the quotient of these two probabilities, which is, yeah, what is it? That's uh, ln of, so what's the quotient? Two, and what's the quotient here? This one? PBA over PB one-half, yes, that's one-half, that's correct. Now one-half, again, a logarithm, it's a logarithm of the reciprocal is just minus, which also follows from the, let's just do it, that's minus ln2, which means I can just, uh, yeah, that's just ln2 times, so it's, here I have the vector 1 minus 1. Okay, and what's the b? Let's also compute the b. The b was just, the b is minus ln, the two class probabilities. Let's also do that. So it's minus ln of PA over PB. What's this? The quotient is 1, yes, and the B is, okay, let me write it. I agree, it's good to do it. And that's 0. So B is 0 here, so I actually have this special case here, which wasn't clear when we did it in the last lecture, right? So what does it mean? It means, uh, and let's just, and I think it's just instructive to have this view, so let's just 
draw it. Let's see, a perfectly straight line. So we are now in two dimensions, right? And now what... Uh, and this is uh, what we have here is the number of A's. And what we have here is the number of B's. And now let's write every document as a... <coughs> Right? It's just a, a two-dimensional vector with a term frequency. And let's just do that. So this should now be, I want a vector where I have TFA, TFB here. And let me do the first one for you. It's just, uh, it's so simple. It's two, one, two A's, one B. <coughs> you tell me the next ones. Hmm? <coughs> 5, 2, I agree. Next one. Hmm? 3, 5. Mm -hmm. three, five. Three, two. 1, 3. See, this is fun. <coughs> 2, 4. <coughs> I'm sorry. So let's. Uh, so our largest thing is five. So let's try to one, two, three, four, five. Perfectly spaced uh, ticks here. Four, five, and here we have. Let's also do one, two, three, four. Five. And now let's just draw the points. <coughs> and it's interesting, right? It's a picture which we didn't have when we did this last week with naive base. And that's always a great thing in mathematics. Do the same thing in a totally different terminology and world. When we did naive base, we were talking about conditional probabilities. Now we are talking about uh, geometry and, and separating hyperplanes and, and points in 2D. So let's draw this one, the 2, 1 point. So 2, 1 is here, right? That's here. And that's class, this has class A. And maybe let's write the class in the same color as above, so as not to get it in any way. And I think that's this red. We should absolutely not confuse. So that's the point 2, 1. What's the next one? 5, 2. I think that's here. That's 5, 2. Yeah, and maybe it's even a good idea to, to write it here. That's the point 2, 1. That's the point 5, 2. This also A. Then now we have 3, 5. Let's draw the point 3, 5. That's up here. Oh, what happened? 3, 5. It's up here. And that was class B. This was uh, class B. Which one? 3, 2. Where is 3, 2? That's down here. 3, 2. It's down here. And you can already figure out where the other points lie. That's here. And then we have uh, 1, 3. That's here. So I draw the two points. So that's the one. 1, 3, and the other one is 2, 4, which is up here. 2, 4, and these two are B points. 2, 4. Okay. And you can already imagine where the hyperpoint, let me also lie. So these are B points. B, B. These are the B points, these are the a points. Now, where does my hyperplane lie? Let me draw it in orange. The orthogonal vector is ln2. What is ln2? It's 0 point, I don't know, something. 1 times minus 1. What's the direction of the 1 times minus 1? I think it goes like this, right? This is my w. This is my w. And this thing goes through the origin because b is equal to 0. So how will it look like? I think it should uh, use these points here. 4, 5. Let me draw a perfectly straight line here. So uh, that's my hyperplane. 
right? This looks like a symbol. How do I make it not look like a symbol? So that's my, I simply just write it next to it. I think that will be good enough. That's my hyperplane, right? That's my W here. What? This doesn't go through the origin. Oh my, I'm so sorry. I have to, what did I? <laughs> it should at least go through the origin. It was so, yeah. So now I have a perfectly straight line going through the origin and see that everything makes uh, sense. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's how I computed it. And now let's take an arbitrary document X. So let's take X uh, TF uh, A comma TF B. So it will be uh, x in a and what we do for x in a we will just do uh, we will just compute w times x which is just uh, yeah we will just compute uh, ln it's strange that it does this but yeah let's just factor out the ln2 and then it's just this vector times tfa tfb which means it's just tfa minus tfb right it's just this vector dot product of these two tfa 1 minus 1 uh, greater or equal to 0 let me just write it as is so x is in a if and only if this here being greater zero, which means uh, equivalent to TF A greater than TF B, which we already found last time by, by different means. And you can also see it here, right? The A's are in this half, the hyperplane goes directly through the middle, and this is what naive base does for this example as a linear separator. There's a question or comment. <coughs> As I see it now, that yeah. uh, to fully understand it right, that the hyperplane will go every time through the middle if we have as much points in A as in B. That means if we do naive base, the hyperplane will, um, the, the, the crossing of the x axis or the A axis will differ if we have differently distributed. I, I'm not sure. Are you talking about whether this line goes through the origin? Yes, that, 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 that I mean. Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's great to ask this question to understand something in detail. Why does it go through the origin here? Well, what's the anchor point here? You could take zero as an anchor point and, and the product I mean, the reason is that the B is zero here. And it's not something I proved, but I should write it, I should write it again because it's actually important for the intuition. So H contains, it was, we mentioned it in this very, H contains origin and prove it yourself at home because the great exercise is equivalent with b equals to zero. We already had a question about this. And why is b equal to zero here? Well, you can answer that question yourself, I think, from the formula. Why is, if, let's go back one slide. Here's the definition of b. When is b equals to zero? Hmm? Yeah, so b equals zero if and only if uh, PA is equal to PB. So it's not that in naive base in general B is equal zero, just in our example the two classes had uh, the same probability and if they would not have then my line would not be, which is also interesting, right? My line would then be shifted. It would not go through the origin. It's not that it would be tilted differently but it would not maybe also but would not go through the origin. Yes please. Yes. Uh, 
It's a very good comment. It's a really good comment. So let's assume. <coughs> I mean, we could shift. Where do you want to shift everything to the right? Uh, to the left. <laughs> to the left. Okay. All points to. To the left is, I think, a little problematic because then you have to subtract something. Shifting to the right is probably easier, right? <coughs> I mean, you can't have negative things here because these are term frequencies. So are you talking about the geometry, geometric problem or about the original problem? Okay, now I, I got confused with the geometric problem, but yeah. if you shift it to the right, then you can see Yeah, if you shift it to the right, there would still always be a plane. It would be a little bit flatter, but also if you shift it to the left, right? But I think one, I, I will take just a second. I think one important comment is there is absolutely no guarantee that naive base finds a linear separator of your data. Just in this example, it does. It could be very well we be with, linear, uh, with naive base that your data is not linearly separable. It will still find a hyperplane and use that for prediction. And everything that's on the wrong side, even your training, even what you get, what were given for training, will be predicted wrongly. I think that's an important comment to make. Is that clear? So there's just no guarantee that naive base separates the data, and you. Sometimes you can't. Yes? And this just means if we have more than two classes, uh, the B is zero if they all are equally distributed now. Yeah. Ah, now the question is if we have more than two classes, then this whole picture doesn't work. The hyperplane linear separation only works for two classes. This, this whole uh, viewing it as linear separation. I mean, a hyperplane just divides a space into two halves, not into more halves. So what, what I showed here is just, I mean, the, the heading should have been two class naive base. For three class naive base, we have no geometric counterpart. I mean, there is no, yeah, it's just two class naive base here. <coughs> Any other question before we, yeah, this, this was simple, you already did it for the sheet, I mean, but I want to separate it because, uh, yeah, the, the hyperplane definition, and this is also very interesting now to understand this in geometry, I mean, let's just go back to the uh, <coughs> definition of, yeah. A hyperplane is just defined that way, so you have an, a W and a B here, because a hyperplane does not go through the origin, but wouldn't it be nicer if we wouldn't even have the B here, if it would always be zero? And now comes the trick how you can always achieve that, and you did it for the exercise sheet, but without really understanding what it means for uh, geometry, <coughs> you can always add one dimension more, and now you consider vectors not in the original dimensional space, which was the number of words, but one more, and you just add a one here and add this class probability here. And now uh, if you just do the linear algebra, you take the dot product of the two, you just have what you want, right? Now, before you had uh, this vector times this and then plus uh, another bias term, and this thing is always there and we, yeah. And so now it's just, this W is just this vector here, where I have here the word distribution and here it is. So by just, and what this means geometrically is, if you lift everything one dimension up, then you can always make it so that the, the hyperplane which you find goes through the origin in one dimension higher. I don't have a picture of that, My maybe you, I don't know, do we get a picture for this? I mean, the only thing we can imagine lifting one dimension up is from 2D in, in to 3D. So you have a, now we have a, I don't, does anyone have the intuition right away? I didn't think about it. If you have a line that doesn't go through the origin and now you lift your data up to, to three dimensions, 
and now you find a plane separating the data which goes through the origin. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. You have a line which does not go through the origin for 2D points. Now you lift your 2D points to three dimensions. And how do you lift them to three dimensions? Well, nothing special, right? They just go through a very, they just all lie in a simple plane. And now your hyperplane, you just have a hyperplane co containing the original line which goes through the origin. I think the geometry uh, intuition isn't very useful, but you can do it. By lifting one dimension up, your hyperplane always goes through the origin. And now it's even nicer. Now you don't even have the B term. Okay, now perceptrons. That's very easy because I don't do any math or very little math, but, and they are super old, but interesting. It's just four slides. So far, so we have seen a bit of theory about linear classifiers and naive Bayes, which somehow arrived at formulas based on Bayes theorems. The perceptron is a linear classifier that iteratively computes the W. So what we have seen here by some right probability theory, we derived at these formulas. Let me just show them again. No, I think that's the best slide. This one here, yeah. That's what naive base does. Naive base uses probability theory to compute this W. But now let's just compute such a W iteratively. That's what the perceptron does. And again, we forget the B. We have lifted everything one dimension up. We just want to find a W, like here. But we want to find it via different means. So what do we do? Uh, yeah, the perception is as old as 1958. Ah, oh, yeah, here's the emoticon. 1958, super old, and it's still pretty much the basic of what's now behind all the deep learning revolution. So all this stuff, basically, most of the theory was already there 70 years ago. Quite amazing. So today. Nobody uses the perception. It's merely of historical purpose, but also didactically because it's so simple and the real thing is pretty similar, which I will also show today. Here's the algorithm. We want to find a good W. So we just start by setting it to zero. We don't know what it is, including the B, dim the last dimension which we added. It's so simple, it's unbelievable. Now we have our training objects. By training objects, I mean these things. We have a nice picture here, right? These thingies here, we are just given them as vectors now, one dimension up. We would have a one added here in the end, and we know they are labels. And now we just go through them, and we go through them many times. And what do we do? We just check Okay, with the W which we currently have, which in the beginning is zero, is it, does it give the right prediction or not, right? It should say positive or negative, depending on the label. If it's not right, we do something, and here's what we do. If it, uh, <clears throat> so if it's right, we don't do anything, we say fine, our W is fine for this point, it does, it predicts the right thing. If it's wrong, so if it's wrong in this way, it's negative, but it should be positive. We just add the point to the weight vector. Very strange. Why do we add the point? If it's uh, greater or equal zero, but it should be negative, we subtract the point from the weight vector. That's it. That's the perception. You see a point. If its prediction is right, go to the next point. If it's wrong, you just add or subtract the point from the weight vector. And now your W changes. And note that it can change pretty wildly, right? You add, subtract the points. How, how can this even converge? And now uh, either you repeat until all predictions are correct, or you just say, let me do this 1,000 times or 1 million times. And note, why does it make sense if you, let's say you have, in my example, how many objects did I have? One, two, three, six, yeah? Shouldn't I stop after six because now I have seen all the points? Well, I start with zero. If I did this six times with all the points, now I have a different W. So it makes sense to start again, right? 
it's true for all the deep learning stuff as well. You have gone once through your training, but now your W, your weights, so in a real neural network, this is something huge, will be different, so it makes sense to do this whole same thing again and again. And the one thing we can understand already for perceptrons, why on earth does it make sense, this strange update rule? You, my weight vector is not good, let me just add the point to the weight vector. I think it's important to be irritated at this point. It doesn't make sense to add the point to the weight vector, it's like it's strange. And let's just look at it. So we have already seen this, so we didn't call it positive, but W no, no, we have called it positive in our proof of the distance, right? That W points to the side of the hyperplane where the positive labels are, the ones with plus one. So, if an object is plus, but, uh, yeah, and let's just, let's just see it. So let's say we have an X and the current value of W says negative, but we want it to be positive. And what our update root then does is, it uh, maybe I should have done it in writing, but now it's already written on the slide. So it's negative, but it should be positive. Now this is the update we do. You can check, I don't show the previous slide again. We will now add the X to the weight vector, which means if I now compute the dot product with a new vector, I get W times X plus X times X. And X times X is just, make sure I have enough space here, this is just X squared, it doesn't really matter what it is, but it's greater or equal to zero. Which means, by changing the weight vector in this way, in this way not in this way, the new product will be larger than the old one. And before it was negative, I want it to be positive, I'm making a change in the right direction. That's all you need to understand at this point. It's negative, I want it to be positive, this makes a change in the right direction. Yeah, it's sort of like a rotation of the thing, right? Because if you have the W and you add some vector to it, the point which the W points towards changes. Yeah. It changes, but why does it rotate? Um. Let's, uh, let's draw it, since you say it, and let's try to understand it. So now, so now we are in the origin case, so we can always draw our... So this... See, I, have, I also have some deficit with drawing things that go through the origin. I'm sure there's a name for this. So this is this, and this is my... Let's do it like this. So this is my W. And now my X should be on that side, but my X goes to the other side. So where should my X... Yeah, it should be on that side, which means my X is somehow going here, right? That's now my X, but my W is... Oh, that's wrong. No, I should have done it. Yeah. Yes, because it's uh, my W gives the wrong, right? Yes. So that's my X. So now W X will be negative, right? That's uh, yeah. It's on the wrong side. W X will be negative, and now I'm adding the X to the W. Maybe I shouldn't make such a long. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't, and, and now I see what you mean, so it's great that you said it. Let's make it a little bit shorter, and let's maybe also, why put, why not draw the W here? So that's my W. And I think you see it already, so let me also draw it. And my X is, uh, maybe my X goes like this, why not like this? And now I, yeah. If I add my x here, I get my new. That's now my w prime, right? And that's my w. That's what you mean, yeah. right? Yes. And now the effect will, of course, be that the new. 
it will be like this. Yes? And now X is on the right side. It doesn't have to be on the right side. I must, I mean, it's just rotating it a little bit. That's really important. I'm just moving it. It's negative. Now it becomes larger. It goes through as positive. I could also not rotate it enough. But I'm, at least I'm rotating it in the right direction. And the same you could draw it for the other picture. If it's on this wrong side, then I will do the opposite. So it's a great picture with the rotation. And and why should this work? Now I'm, I see a sample, I'm rotating this way, that way, it's wiggling back and forth, it's absolutely not clear why this should converge, and, and we don't do that proof, but one can actually, uh, yeah, that was the other, one can prove that it converges. So actually there's a theorem, we, we don't even look at it, because that's really just for historical interest. If you can separate the data, but it's fascinating that you can prove it, then you can even specify after so many uh, iteration it will converge. It will actually converge. So by wiggling back and forth, if you only go over the data frequently enough, you will find the W that separates them. And instead of doing this, now we do what you would really do nowadays, you would use logistic regression. And this is a method which is still used, which is kind of the simplest neural network which you can have and everything else is just the same but more complicated. So logistic regression is like the nucleus of, of deep learning and it's, it's great to, to look at it and try to understand it. And it's six more slides and I will need half an hour I think for it and we shouldn't rush and, and we will make another, we will make a break when my classifier senses that you are falling asleep or thinking of Mr. Beast videos or secretly watching them. Let's start with some, and, and the mathematics is truly beautiful, and uh, most of it quite simple also. So logistic regression sigmoid function, which is uh, like the basis of so much in deep learning. Here's the sigmoid function, and let me, it's one over let me draw it, write it myself in mathematics. So this is one over one in, in nicer notation, I meant e to the minus t. And let's draw this, let's look at this function because it's, uh, this is so important to understand. So let's look at it. Let's draw it like this and here's the x-axis. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I have to draw the right thing, I need here, I need to, I don't need the negative y part, I just need the, so this is the origin here, and here is uh, 1, so the outcome, I mean that should be clear, it's always uh, a value between 0 and 1, Actually, it never reaches zero and it never reaches one. So I can even write an open interval here. And what does it do? Let's look at it, let's do it in, uh, here I have 0 0.5. And it goes through there. And it will look like this. It will look like this. It comes from here and then here. So it's kind of a phase, so that's a sigma of uh, t. So if this is t, and yeah, that's... Uh <coughs> so it goes like this, so here's some properties. So the first we see, and we can easily just check it. So if it goes to minus infinity, and, and I don't prove this, you can look at it. Minus infinity, minus minus infinity is, is e to the infinity, so this becomes infinitely large, 1 over infinity is 0, which means minus infinity, this uh, approach is 0, and actually pretty quickly, because the exponent goes, so it goes down pretty quickly here, so most of the things are happening here near, near t equals 0. What happens if it goes to infinity? 
then e to the minus infinity goes to zero, one plus zero is zero, one over one, it goes to one. What happens at exactly zero? It's uh, 0 0.5. If you plug in e to the zero, it's one, it's one over two, 0 0.5. So it's this nice symmetric thing. That's the sigmoid function. And just the intuition for why you use it, you want probabilities and you have something that's any number, minus 500, plus 2, 0, whatever, and you want to turn it into a probability, you can use sigma, because it will give you a number between 0 and 1, not even including 0 and 1. And what it does, and that's why it's important, it, it's turning things away from 0 0.5. If your number is even a little positive, it will go to 1 very quickly, right? So you're making things more extreme than they are. If your number is minus 3, sigma of minus 3 will almost be 0. So it's kind of pushing things away from the middle, and that's an important function. Here two more nice properties, which we... Uh, let's prove these. So P1, proof uh, of P1, we don't do it, you just just uh, just plug it in. This is just, I mean, you don't really plug in infinity, but you do the, so let's do the proof of P2. Property 2, if I do sigma of minus t, and this is certainly things which you could be asked in an exam. So sigma of t is just 1 over 1 plus, and now it's e to the minus t minus minus t, now it's e to the t. And now I want to get back to something with sigma of t again, so let's just divide by e to the minus t in the numerator, e to the minus t. I just multiply the numerator and the denominator by e to the minus t, and when I do that, I get this. So I did two things, I multiplied this by e to the minus t and changed the order, right? e to the t times e to minus t gives 1, 1 times e to the minus t gives this e to the minus t, and now, yeah, it's almost there, let me just do, this is 1 plus e to the minus t over 1 plus e to the minus t minus. So I just add 1 and subtract 1, 1 to the e to the minus t, and this is just 1 and this is just sigma of t. And this is this P2 property we can see here, right? It essentially means that I have this rotational symmetry here. This part is just this part rotated. This is exactly what P2 means. And P3 will be very useful in the following. That just says that the derivative can again be expressed in terms of the original function which is often the case when you work with the exponential function, because as you know, e to the x, if you derive it, is just e to the x again. So let's just do it. Let's derive it. Sigma prime of t first looks a bit scary, so it's this function up here. So it's, uh, well, we have, so I hope you know that 1 over x, if I derive it, it's uh, minus, 1 over x square, and then I have to take a chain rule like inner derivative, so this is now minus 1 to the, this whole thing square, 1 plus e to the minus t square times, and now I have to take the derivative of 1 plus e to the minus t, and that's uh, e to the minus t, Der derivative e to the minus t is e to the minus t with a minus, minus e to the minus t. Is that correct? I hope so. And that's now, yeah, let me, so that's now minus one, okay, it's the minus cancels out, so I have, I already have one sigma t here, 
this is, it's not a plus, it's a T. And I have another one here, which I just e to the minus t over 1 plus e to the minus t. And this I've already seen here, that e to the minus t over 1 plus e to the minus t is uh, 1 minus sigma. So that's sigma, or let me write it one below and then we are done. Sigma over t times 1 minus sigma over t. So this is certainly something you should uh, do for yourself and see if you can prove it. And it's not too hard. So here I was just using what I already had here. This here and this here is the same thing and I already proved that it's 1 minus sigma over t. Yeah. So the derivative, this also has an intuition but it's a little more complicated. But what's important here is that you can express the derivative in terms of the original function, which is nice. And uh, let's see some terminology. Then we make another break, and I hope some people still stay for the last 15 minutes or so. You need it for the exercise sheet, so I want it to be on the recording. I think we make a break now and then we, we do the rest. And I hope that some of you still stay. Thank you for your patience. So we resume in five minutes. So, last five slides. Can you hear me again now? Yeah, for the Zoom people, you're too far away to yeah, hear the sound waves from the room. So, just some simple terminology. So let's do this. So n is now our dimension of the input space. It includes the, the bias term dimension, this one dimension which we added. So for our naive base example, we would now be in 3D space, but it's not important. So for in the text world, size of our vocabulary plus one. So now we totally go away from, that's just the deep learning view, we don't care where our points come from. That's really important, that's the transition which we made over this uh, whole thing now, whole lecture. We started with text document, there was always this intuition documents, here these were already abstract documents, now it's just points, points in d-dimensional space. Can you maybe close the door back there? I think we have enough air here now for 15 more minutes. Now we are just in this abstract setting, points, we want to find the separating hyperplane. So that's where we are now. And I go to here, yeah. And now the labels, and typically you call them X, so that's the points, and these are the training examples from which you want to learn. And now they have labels, and uh, these labels in the general case, they are so K classes, and here we just have two classes, so it's just 0 or 1. You call them Y. So here we just have a 0 or 1, and we have N of them. N training examples, N labels, which are either 0 or 1. You call them X and Y. What I tell you now can also general, be generalized to more classes. Today we only do two classes because we only looked at two class naive base. Only two class naive base is a linear uh, separator. And also we still apply to our original data and we do that like I showed on the one slide. You just do completely independently from each other, learn to separate comedy from not comedy, horror from not horror, and you can just do that five times. It will be clear when you do the exercise sheet. That's just a dumb way to do multi-classification if you just have binary classification. What's now our probabilistic model? And it's super simple. Look at how simple and also how elegant it is. We want to find this W. You always want to find this W, which somehow helps you to separate the data. And uh, we just need, and, and we want to take the dot product with x, because that's what we do, which is just this linear thing, but that's not a probability, right? Dot product is minus 15, 0, plus 1 million, anything. But we have this sigmoid, which maps any number to a probability between 0 and 1. 
That's what I explained just before the break. So we just say, given a weight vector, the probability that the label is 1 is just a sigmoid of the dot product, and the probability that the label is the other thing, thing which we call 0, is just the opposite. So that's a probability distribution. That's just the model of logistic regression. So it can't, you just turn the dot product and the probability using the sigmoid function. You could use any other function as well, but this just has these nice properties, which we will use in a second. And now, what does naive Bayes do in comparison? What it does is, Ha, maybe that's not so, I, I don't want to go into depth here, maybe you can do that yourself, but how did we derive, um, maybe we can do, if you remember, let me just write that here, there was this PA, and uh, this PA vector, and that was just the LN of this uh, P1 from class A, and so on, from LN, P, I don't know what uh, my dimension here is, N of A, yeah, it was this, so now I'm in, and, and then I get the log probability, so if I want the exponent, uh, actual probability, I have to uh, take the exponent again in the end, right? This gave us, yeah, this gave us, this gave us uh, LN of this P, C class for a document D, uh, in this case the class is A, how I've written it here. And so if you want the actual probability, then you have to take the exponent again, which means you get something like this for naive base. So instead of taking the sigmoid, you take here the exponential function, and now you have these two things, and so there's a probability distribution. If you really want the probabilities, which we don't for naive base, you need some constant factors here, so that this is a probability distribution. And uh, yeah, what's behind this is, is computing the softmax. I'm just mentioning this if you are uh, familiar with some deep learning speak and, and how this is related. But what's interesting is both here have these properties of uh, of pushing things away from the middle towards uh, 0 or 1, right? The sigmoid does this, so if this is like a little very negative, it will be pushed to 0, positive to 1, and the exponential function also does this, right? Small differences here will be pushed apart very quickly. And that's also what the softmax does. If you have two values, softmax just computes not strictly the larger one, but it will push the larger one to one and the smaller one to, to zero. Anyway, so here's the update rule for logistic regression. So logistic regression is also iterative, but now we do it, uh, this should be blue, but I leave it black for now. So what we want to do, and here's another super nice thing. So. Where does this now come from? This probability, well, if you look at it, so it's now one function before I wrote down what it is for. So if you write this down for y equals zero, then this is just one to the, uh, yeah, this just becomes one here, and then it's just, yeah, let me not, let me just write down what it is. If, if y is equal to zero, then it's just this part, right? Then it's just uh, one minus sigma of w times x to the power of one, and this vanishes. And if y is equal to one, then uh, one minus one is zero, this vanishes, and it's just sigma times w. X. And I always draw the dot product with a fat dot so that you can distinguish it from the other thing. And look how nice it is. This is uh, just turning the into one function, right, for any y. And now I can even plug in any y in between and I can, can compute derivatives, which is also very nice. But the two border case exactly with what I started with. And now we want to 
maximize this. So we have this probability and we want to find a W, we, we want to find a good W as usual, such that this is as large as possible. This is uh, maximum likelihood, right? You want to, this is the probability of the data we are seeing and we want to maximize this. As usual, we don't maximize this because this is an ugly function, but we want to maximize the log of this. And uh, here's the log of this. And now we could just do maximum likelihood estimation, derive this by uh, W, and then you will get a function, you will find that it does not work. There's no closed function for this. So even for this relatively simple model, I mean, it's not the most complex expressions here, you ar arrive at something where you can't do closed form. So I want to find like the maximum, the W, which maximizes this, but we can't. And in that scenario, what you do, and let me also draw a picture here, maybe that one. So you have a function. Let me just draw the function. And you want to find the maximum. Maybe the function goes like this, and you are here, and you want to find the maximum. So what you do is you compute and uh, so this is now, maybe I should, so this is the W, and now I'm just drawing this in, like in, in one-dimensional, but the W is of course more complex, but you can do this, the same thing in, in multi-dimension. I want to find the W where this function is the largest, that would be here. I'm here at some W, and I don't know where the maximum is, so what I just do is I compute the gradient, which in this, uh, one-dimensional case would be the derivative at this point. The derivative points to where do I go uphill, and actually where does it go uphill the uh, steepest. And that's, uh, that's where I go. And now I just go a step in that direction. And as you can see in that picture here, I would at least arrive at this intermediate. I think it's not optimal when it's too close to my mouth. So I would find this one here. I don't necessarily find the global optimum. It's always a problem with these methods, but at least I go in the right direction. So I can't compute closed form, but iteratively I go uphill in the direction where W becomes larger. And that's what we do now. So we just compute the gradient of this thing here, and let's do that, because that's nice. And then that's the last non-trivial mathematics, and then we are done. <coughs> so we will just... This is our thing here, and we will compute the derivative of this. And this is now something which maybe you haven't done before a lot. So let me just mention some things. So I want to take this thing here, this is the likelihood function, and I want to take the derivative. So I want to take the derivative of y times ln sigma of w times x plus 1 minus y times ln 1 minus sigma of w times x. And another. So. And now I derive by a vector, yeah? And I don't know how many of you have already derived by vectors, but the nice thing is if you just take standard calculus and uh, do it in higher dimensions, many of the things, of course, you have to know which uh, just carry over. For example, if you take the dot product, which you can just, I mean, this one you could really just prove by writing down the definition of the pro dot product and then taking the derivatives with respect to each component of W. But if you do that, then the same things comes out as you expected from the one-dimensional space. Deriving dot product W times X by W, if this were the standard product, it would just be X is the constant term here, right? It's just X. So let's just 
let's not think about higher dimensions too much, let's just compute the derivative as if this were a normal dot. And how would it look like? So then this would be like, and I hope there's nothing else on that slide, ln, let's just do some. So what's ln sigma of x prime? And it's actually fairly simple. I've said that many times, mathematics, just a combination of very simple things. ln is just one over this thing, and now I have to compute the inner product. So that's just this here, right? Which is, and that's just the chain rule here. Which you all know, of course. Chain rule. So, and let's just do that here. And it's just beautiful how everything uh, will work out now. So that's just now y times one over sigma of w times x times, now I take the derivative, and the derivative is this, we computed that earlier, so that's now sigma times w, I'm just plugging in this thing here, w times x times one minus sigma of w times x. And now, now I don't have x here, but w times x, so chain rule twice. This is the chain rule twice here. I have to do it again. Twice. <coughs> so if I, maybe I should write it upstairs so that this is clear if I do it uh, twice. So I have ln sigma of w times, now I have even something inside here. If I compute that derivative, then it's 1 over sigma of w times x. That's just from the ln. Then I have to take the derivative of this one, w times x, and now I have to take the derivative of w times x, which is just the x. Right? The chain rule is, is so simple. So it's, I also have to write x here. And now I have to do the same thing for the other part. This is 1 minus epsilon times, now it's 1 over 1 minus sigma of w times x. And now I have to take the inner product of uh, that one, that's now minus times minus sigma of, uh, yeah, and that's just now sigma, yeah, this one derivative goes to zero, now it's minus the sigma prime of this, so I'm, I again plug in this here, sigma times w times x times 1 minus sigma w times x, dip, 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 and I take the, yeah, where do I write the x? Again, the derivative of the w x should also be here and here. And I cannot emphasize enough, this is like computing 3 plus 5 over 7 minus 4 squared. It's just this, you have to concentrate, but it's, it's nothing more. It's a fairly simple thing applied to a complex expression. And now magic happens, I mean this cancels out, and this cancels out here. And what I get, not much remains at the end, this is now y times 1 minus sigma of w times x times x plus 1 minus y, and this should be a minus here, I think. <coughs> times, and here I have the sigma times w 
times x times x. And this is y minus sigma w times x times x for y if y is either 0 or 1 I mean let's just check whether it's true I hope I didn't make a mistake let's just if y I mean we compute it with this as if y were any number but actually we are in the training where y is either 0 or 1 it's uh, this class or this class so if y is 0 then this whole thing is 0 and uh, yeah maybe let's no I don't think I have to let's just check it whether it's correct if y is 0 then this is 0 1 minus 0 is 1 and the whole thing is just uh, no no then we have hmm, if y is 0 is it correct this is 0 here we have Ah, you will see. Let's just check. Okay. Let's do it in our, I think it's correct, but I haven't, if y is zero, let's just check the two, let's just check, I mean it looks weird, doesn't look the same, let's just check the two and let's try to do it in our minds for y is zero and y is one. y is zero. This is now zero and here we have, this is uh, one, so we have minus sigma wxx. And here, y is 0 minus sigma wxx. It's correct, right? By some magic, it's correct. Let's do it for 1. If y is 1, then this falls away. And here I have 1 times 1 minus sigma times x. If I plug in 1 here, 1 minus sigma times x. It's, a, it's magic, but it's true, right? It's so this, uh, this super complicated derivative of this little monster here just becomes this y minus sigma wx I don't even need a case distinction or anything so yeah it's true if you don't believe it I'm convinced and now comes the yeah I think it's the last slide so <coughs> what you now do this is what I explained on the slide before so we just we can't like we did for the maximum likelihood in the last lecture, actually compute the optimum here, but we can at least compute the derivative. And now I just, this is my, right, this is my, the w I have now, and the next w prime will just be a step in the direction of the gradient here. So this orange thing here is now w of w of L, right? So that the likelihood, uh, this is my likelihood of the data, this L which I defined here. And so and now see what comes out if I just, I mean that's what I computed here by just taking the derivative. I just add it so it's alpha times this thing which my label is either 0 or 1 and then it's sigma times this thing times x and now compare it to the <laughs> perceptron rule. And the perceptron, and that's really, f I mean, yeah, it's just without this, right? It was just w plus x. So this factor here was 1. And logistic regression, which has many advantages, and you could never have come up with this by your, just by guessing, right? It just does this. And the alpha, I will, the alpha is just some constants. And the constant makes uh, sense because you have to say how much do I go in this direction. That's just the learning rate, right? I have a gradient and now I say 0 0.1 times the gradient. How big a step do I do in that direction before I say, okay, let's look at where I'm now. Let's look at in which direction I take the next step. 
That's the learning rate. And almost everything I say here generalizes to everything of, of learning, not just logistic regression. So all very general principles. So the perception, this super old thing, is just this without the theory and just a one. And here I have this, which gives better results. And here's one more thing, and then we are done, and I would be happy if you have some more questions, but I'm done then. Uh, so this is now like the perceptron. I look at one example from my training, I compute this, and then I make, I, I update my W in that direction. What you would always do in practice is you take several examples at once and you make one big step. And it's actually trivial what you do. I've written it down here. You have to implement it and understand it first. You just take all these things together for, for let, let's say you take a batch, it's called a batch now of 10. You just compute the direction for each of the 10 and take the average and you take that step. Yeah? So you would, uh, and that's different from doing the steps one after the other. If you would do them one after the other, then after the first step you would already be somewhere else and, uh, and, and do a slightly different step. And the big uh, advantage is, look here, you have this W times XI, so that's a dot product, and if you have several X's then this becomes a vector matrix multiplication. So let's say you do this for 1,000 samples at a time, then it's just dot product between a matrix with your 1,000 samples and the weight matrix. So that's the one thing you compute, and now it's a number, and this will be, the rest is trivial. So like the update strap is one matrix vector product, gives you a number, you compute this number, and then you go yeah, and here you have again, um, yeah, that's the averages of your sample. So actually what you do in the end, and you will see it in your code when you do it, I'm afraid one can implement it without understanding too much, but of course try to understand why you do it. But uh, in the end it will be very little code again, yeah. And this is called uh, batching, and M is called the batch size, and uh, so you have a number of parameters here, hyperparameters they are called, the learning rate for the exercise sheet, just play around with it, see what happens if I take 0 0.1 here, one small less, that's also what you do in learning, you have the batch size, smaller or larger batches. Oh, and the other thing, the other hyperparameter, as I told you, you can go over your data once, over all the points, and that's called an epoch. I think it's not written on the slide, but it's written on the exercise sheet, right? It's called an epoch in deep learning, and now you can go over the data again, because now you have a different W, and that's the third hyperparameter. And these, you have them in all of deep learning, learning rate, how often do you go over your training data, number of epochs, and how big a batch, how many sample points at once to make a step. And you will play around with this for this simplest of all learning methods. So sorry for the extra time, but I hope you enjoyed it anyway or learned something. Is there any uh, question now? Yes, please. Why does gradient go up? It's a very good question. So if you remember, likelihood is, I want to, I'm asking if you remember the coin toss example from the last lecture, what's the probability that I'm actually seeing this sequence which I'm seeing? And now I want to find the parameter so that pr that probability is largest. That was the likelihood. Maybe in the interest of time, let me not, I would like to go to that slide now, but, but maybe not because people want to go home, so I want to maximize maximum likelihood is maybe not so easy to understand. I want to maximize, I want to find the parameter so that the probability for what I'm seeing is uh, the largest for that parameter. And, and I don't know that parameter. And in the last lecture we just computed it because the, the functions were simple enough. But here I can't compute it, so I want to know for which W, 
And here I just drew a function. Is this likelihood, this L, the largest? So let me say it again. I want to find the W so that this is maximal. And now I just start with some W. I am here and I want to find this point here. And then I just compute the derivative, the radiant here, and go in that direction. Yeah, minus would go down. If I want to find the minimum, then I would take minus. But I want to find the maximum here. I want to find because it's maximum likelihood, yeah. Exactly, if I would take minus, but the gradient goes, yeah, that's geometric intuition of what the derivative does. It goes upwards. Any other questions? Thank you for the question. So, have a nice evening, thank you and see you next week. Bye-bye.